Hey church family, happy Friday. It's good to be back with you again this week. If you are like me, uh, with some young kids at home and spending a lot more time around them, you are probably realizing that you're using some repeated phrases uh, with your kids. Maybe there are things like, be nice, don't hit him, be kind, eat that, or don't eat that, or whatever. It could be a ton of different things. And if you don't have kids, uh, you probably remember your parents using repeated phrases with you when you were growing up. And when we do that, when we use a repeated phrase, it's because there's something important uh, that we want to, to get through to our kids, either in their minds or their hearts. And all of that has got me thinking uh, this week about some repeated phrases that we see in the scriptures. Maybe you remember in Philippians where Paul over and over and over again says rejoice. At one point, he even goes so far as to say, it's no trouble for me to tell you again, rejoice. Uh, it's important. It's a necessary thing for us to think about. And maybe you've picked up on over the last few weeks the repeated phrases that we've been using. Uh, I've been mentioning this idea of the three great loves of a disciple. The upward love for God, an inward love for one another in the church body, and the outward love uh, for people that uh, we want to share the gospel with. Or maybe you've heard us use our ministry pillars uh, repeatedly. The idea of the centrality of the gospel transformational community, and missional movement. Those three things are really important, but maybe when you hear those things too, you maybe wonder to yourself, well, are those things ever in competition? Or which one of those things is most important? Well, the fact of the matter is that all of those things mutually inform one another. It's as if those things, the upward love for God, the inward love for one another, the outward love for our neighbor, or our ministry pillars, the centrality of the gospel, transformational community, missional movement, those things mutually inform each other. They're, they're more cyclical in their relationship. And you see how these things are repeated over and over and over again through the scriptures. And so today, we're going to look at a passage of scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to 1 Peter 2. We're going to look at verses 9 through 12. But we're going to come back even to a concept that we introduced last week, and we're going to spend some time over the next few weeks just unpacking uh, what Peter talks about here in verses 9 through 12 of chapter 2. Because this passage is paradigmatic, I think, for how we're supposed to understand ourselves as the people of God or the church. The church, a lot of times, we, I think we get confused between what we do as the church and who we are. And we're going to see here that what we do actually needs to flow from who we are. Um, that our doing flows from our being. Let me read the text for us. It says in verse 9 of chapter 2, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul and keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. Again, last week we introduced this idea of the priesthood of all believers and, and Peter talks about that here. And we're going to try to, again, unpack the different layers of what's going on in just these four verses over the next few weeks. But again, what I want us to get our minds around today is that what we do as the church flows naturally out of who we are as the church. When we use the word church, a lot of times we use it in a particular way and our language betrays that we, that we may not understand the importance of what it is. Um, see, the word church is the Greek word ekklesia. It literally means called out ones. Those who have been called from. You see that idea here. We're chosen. We've been called out. We were called out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. We're chosen by God. This is a really important concept to get our minds around because usually when we think about the church, we describe ourselves, or we describe the church rather, as a place that we would go or an event that we attend, right? We, we would say that the church is a building or the church is that event that we go to on Sundays. 
And while that, there are aspects of that that may be true, that's not really at the heart of what the church is, or better, who the church is. See, the church at its core is an identity. It's not just an action. It's not just an activity. It's really an identity. Though absolutely, there are activities that go along with being a part of the called out ones of God. And, and we're going to see that as we work our way through this here too. But when you think about the church, if you had to define that, capital C, what is the church? Here's how I would define it. The church, capital C, is the gathered or scattered people who have been redeemed by God through Jesus and who are empowered by his grace and his Holy Spirit for his mission. That's what the church is. It spans all of redemptive history. It's not just true when we're gathered together on Sunday. It's also true when we're scattered throughout the week. That is the church, capital C. But a church, who are we as a local church? Well, here would be my description uh, of our church or a local church. And again, listen as I give this for the three different loves of a disciple or for those ministry pillars. Because again, these things flow out of this text here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. And I think they're inseparable from one another. Here's how I would describe a local church. It's a local gathering or scattering of followers of Jesus who seek to hear and live out the good news of Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection, and who are transformed by his spirit through community and mission. That's what the church is. That's what we are. And again, you see in this text that, that Peter is really focused first and foremost on identity. See, our doing, whatever activity we do as a church, it better flow out of our identity. And Peter makes that abundantly clear. Did you notice how many descriptions of identity were present in this text? He says that we're a chosen nation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He goes on and on and on here. But he's contrasting it with an old identity. He says we were rejected, but now we're accepted. He says we were at one time not a people, but now we're God's people. At one point, we were corrupted, living according to the passions and patterns of our flesh. But now we're holy. We're set apart for God. He calls us beloved. He calls us sojourners and, exi and exiles, even living in and among a, a new culture. Peter is so focused on this idea of identity. But maybe you picked up on the fact that there are two so that's present here. He says, after all this description of identity in verse 9, he says, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out. And then in verse 12, he says, I want you to keep your conduct pure or honorable so that other people might be able to glorify God on the day of Jesus' visitation. So here's the point. It is our activity that flows from our identity. But the church primarily is about an identity. And it's an identity that we have whether we're gathered together or we're scattered. It's true now, just as true now as it was before covid the fact is that Jesus has indeed invited us into his mission. Gospel, community, and mission. Those three things, they naturally inform one another. Another way of saying it is that, that being sent by Jesus flows out of being saved by him. Another way of saying it would be saying that our, our mission flows out of Christ's redemption. Those things are inseparable. They belong together, according to Peter. And it's up to us. The, the more that we get our hearts and our minds around that, the more we're going to live into that new identity and into those new activities that God is inviting us into as his people. And so just as we wrap this up, I want, I want to remind you of one more thing. When it comes to this idea, again, of the up, in, and out loves, our outward love for the lost, our outward love for people who are near to us but are, that are currently far from God, it's only going to be as effective as our upward love for God and our inward love for one another. Again, it's important. Jesus says this. It's repeated all throughout Scripture. Jesus said in John 13, 
that people are going to know that we're his disciples by the way that we love one another. So during this time, I've been so encouraged to hear about the way that you guys have been taking care of one another. I want to just spur you on towards more of that. And if you need help and you haven't reached out yet, we want to be here to help you during this time. Because there's a world that's watching and that's waiting to see a community that is living with love for one another and for God. So as we live into this identity, we're going to end up living out of it. And so as you go throughout the rest of your Friday, as you think about those things tomorrow and as you prepare for worship on Sunday, remember that this is who we are. We're God's church. We're his people. We're those that have been called to live uh, with a love for God and a love for one another that expresses itself as well in a love for our neighbors. So we're praying for you guys. We love you guys. We miss you guys. And we look forward to being together again on Sunday. Take care.